WX Widgets is a great desktop UI library that gives you access to many native controls like buttons, lists, text fields and so on, regardless of the operating system you use. But what if you need something simpler? Just a basic window to draw your OpenGL renders and some keyboard and mouse events handling. That's where GLFW may help. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to set up this library in your project so that it's automatically downloaded and compiled during the build process. No more time wasted on manually downloading libraries and trying to make them work. We will also see how to handle events with GLFW to implement a simple rotation with the help of GLM, a popular math library. So if that sounds interesting to you, make sure you like and subscribe and let's begin. Here's our main build configuration. Our core app contained in the source directory is configured as an external project that depends on GLFW, Glue and GLM. These can be found in the third-party folder. GLFW is automatically downloaded from Git, compiled and installed locally in the build directory. Glue is used to resolve OpenGL function addresses. This time we download the zip release instead of checking out the repository. CMake can handle decompressing an archive without any problems. GLM, the math library, is checked out from the repo, but there is no build step. It's a header-only library, so instead of compiling it, we copy the headers to the build folder. Now the build script for our core application. We set the directory variables for GLFW and Glue to the install locations in our local build folder so that the find package calls know where to look for the libraries. Then we set our sources, add the executable and link with the libraries using target link libraries. Note that we don't use Win32 in the add executable call. GLFW does not use the Win main function on Windows. Instead, we use the standard main entry point on all platforms. Our Visual Studio Code configuration launches the CMake build and configure tasks when we run the app. Let's do that now. Our app window did show up, so everything went smoothly. You can see that CMake indeed did download the libraries and perform the compilation steps as we described in CMake lists. Let's jump into the code. We start with a shader program variable and shader source constants. We keep this global for simplicity, but in larger programs you should definitely abstract them out to separate modules. Then comes the square vertices array, containing the list of points for our square. Note that the vertices in the middle are duplicated. That's what we need to do if you want to draw using GL lines. Check out my vertex buffer tutorial for more on this topic. The main function is where we initialize our libraries. The order of operations is important, so make sure you get this right. The first step is to initialize the GLFW library. Note that this function does not create a window. The window hints are where we specify which OpenGL version should be used by GLFW. Note the Apple specific line. On Mac, only the forward compatible OpenGL context is supported, so this configuration is crucial for that platform. Next, we create the window using half of the screen height as both its width and height. It's important to activate the context using GLFW make context current before we call any OpenGL functions. This includes initializing glue to load OpenGL function pointers, which we do next. After that, we do our standard OpenGL setup. Here we compile the shaders, prepare the buffers, and transfer the data to the GPU. If that's something new to you, be sure to check other OpenGL tutorials on my channel, where I explain these steps in detail. Next, we connect the frame buffer size change callback to update the GL viewport and render the content with the new window dimensions. It's important to call the render method in the callback. This enables redrawing while the user is resizing the window and not just when the resize process ends. The next step is to create the event loop. Unlike WS widgets, GLFW does not do that for us, but the implementation is super simple. We have a while loop that breaks when the user closes the window. Inside the loop, we call the render function and poll for events. Finally, we delete OpenGL objects and terminate the program. And here's our render function. This is standard OpenGL stuff. Clear the screen, activate the shader and draw the currently bound vertex array. At the end, swap the buffers 
drawing everything on the screen. Let's add some event handling. We will rotate our square when the user presses the arrow keys. We start by including the relevant GLM headers and creating our rotation variable. Then we add the matrix uniform to the shader, remembering to multiply the vertex position by that matrix. We will encapsulate input processing in a function declared here. Inside the function body, we check if the left or right key is pressed and then adjust the rotation matrix. We also update the uniform variable in the shader just before calling glDrawArrays. Finally, we add the process input call to our event loop. As you can see, everything builds correctly and the user can rotate the square using arrows. There is one problem though. The rotation speed depends on how fast the machine can render the context and it can vary between operating systems or hardware used. If the render call is quick, we immediately jump to the beginning of the loop and call process input. If the user holds an arrow key for one second, this means the faster machine will call that method more times. And because with each call we rotate everything by a constant number of degrees, the square will rotate more on the faster machine during that time. One way to fix this problem is to measure how long it took to render a single frame and base our rotation angle on that variable. Here's how we can do it. We add a new parameter to our process input function, the time delta between renders. We set our desired rotation speed and use it to calculate the angle. In the main function, we measure the time it took to do one full event loop iteration and pass that value to the process input function. You might wonder what happens in the first iteration of the loop when the last frame start time is zero. The glfw getTime function measures the time since the glfw initialization. This means that the first delta time value will be larger than the subsequent ones. That's not a problem in our case, as the user won't be able to hit the arrow key during the first few calls to process input. One last thing to do is to update the function declaration with the new delta time argument. Let's run the app and see what happens. We see that, indeed, the 90 degree rotation takes about one second and the results are consistent across platforms and hardware configurations. And that's it for this tutorial. Thanks for watching.